brimstone. Stop that fighting. I have enough men in those mountains to sink every ship in this harbor, and so help me, I'll do it. That's our pa's voice. Music to my ears. Just like a bugle call saying charge. Oh, me and Adam will tell you something if you'll calm down. I am calm. You're shouting. I'm not shouting. And don't think for one minute that I'm going to accept this cock and bull story. Do you hear me? I hear you, Paul. Honest feet, I do. Boys, as I told you once, I told you a thousand times, if you want to do any roughhousing, do it. Outside! Stop it! Now, did you hear what I said? Now, stop that nonsense. Go! Adam! Push! Stop it! I, I don't want to appear unreasonable. But I'm running this ranch, not that dog's hair. I don't have anything against education. As long as it doesn't interfere with your thinking. Joseph, stand up. Stand up. No, Joseph! Cut it out, will you? Hey, you, you call me, Pa? If you have to tell stories at this time of night, tell some quiet Stand ones. Killing me. Oh. And it's going to stay that way until after the contest tomorrow. Yes, and it's a dang good thing it is tomorrow. One more night like this, and you'll both be out in the barn, sleeping there. Now, listen to me. Get to bed! You told me that you were drunk because you were trying to capture bank robbers. That's right. That's right, and, and, and there's, gonna, there's a crime about to be committed. Joseph, there is a crime about to be committed, and I'm desperately restraining myself from committing it this very instant. Oh, you are, are you? Well, you listen to me, young man. I still run this ranch. I'm still your father, and as long as you continue to live on the Ponderosa, you'll do exactly as I say. And that includes volunteering to perform any errands or business deals Mr. Milbank has been forced to delay while he recuperates. Joseph! Joseph! Joseph, where are you? Hi, Pa, you call me? Father, father, father worries, and nevertheless, you tend to see in your children only what you hope you'll see, I guess. I'll, uh, I'll get the blanket and some pillows. All right, thanks, Father. A very understanding father. Yes, he is. We're kind of proud of him. But I'll tell you, I learned something. I learned to be grateful. For what? To you, for being such a good Paul. Joe and me and Adam teaching us how to hunt and fish and ride and work and just stuff like that. Just everything in general. Just grateful. Anything wrong with that? No. No, there isn't. No, he's not going to mind. That's a promise. You're going to get the first coat. Your father must be a very rare man, amigo. Yeah, I think so. I think you'll think so, too. It's good, son. It's good. Everything's gonna be all right. You pause right here. Father? And you just rest easy. Adam and I agree. Do everything you can inside the law. But that's all. If you try to free us by force, you know, Hawkins, men will slaughter you. Besides, you'll be coming up against these lawmen and be shooting at our friends. That's no good. I you don't have to worry none, Paul. We... Hoss, I want you to promise me no violence. Yes, sir. Don't let Farmer Perkins go. In one hour, the father will be wearing a new necktie. my sons to make their own decisions. Wouldn't it be simpler to just 
hand over Captain Johnson to the Indian? If I'd wanted to hand Captain Johnson over to Cochise, I wouldn't be here now wondering whether my oldest son were alive or dead. I want you to do something for me. Well, what's that? Break these. Break these? Mm -hmm. All right. Wait a minute. <laughs> you wouldn't think they'd... Holy... Well, I can't do it, Bob. That's right. Well, they're together like this. You can't break them. But... Singly, they can be broken. By himself. Each one of us can be broken. Now, well, that... Pride stand in your way, son. We're all here if you need us. I'll remember that part. Everybody get started on this idea. Those trees aren't going to cut themselves. <laughs> if Joe's back in the morning, I won't say a word about this. Get out of here and good luck to you. But if he's hurt in any way, I'll come after you, Dan. And there won't be a place on earth far enough or dark enough to hide you. I had to raise my boy alone, without the help or love of a mother. But I raised him, and I love him, and I would give him up if deep in my heart I felt I would hurt him by telling him the truth. Adams. Yeah. Tracks show three horses. One man on foot. Tracks Peter out there by the rocks. We'll have to spread out, cover every direction. Oh. You need to get some rest, boy. You ain't had no sleep in three days. Not till we find them. Not till we find them. Horse, you go around by these rocks. Joe, you go in that direction. I'm following this trail. What are you thinking about? Oh, I was just... just wondering how... Horse and Joe are doing. That <laughs> figures. Hmm? You should be worrying about them. What's the matter? What are you thinking about? Oh, um, just wondering what Hoss was up to. I'm sure he's doing all right. Mm. I shouldn't have let him go. Oh, now, come on. He's a big boy, boy. He can take care of himself. Yeah, no. Just that no matter how much older you boys get, I still think of you as my little boy. <laughs> I guess I always will. It's getting kind of late. I was just... Wondering where you were. Oh, Pa. Always worrying, huh? No, I, I wasn't worried. Oh, no, come on now, come on. You were worrying? Nobody makes much sense sometimes when you think about it. You have problems. And you hope for the day when they'll be over. And when they are over, you dream up new problems to take their place. Oh, uh, that's, uh, well, that's, that's a, it's a, a camisole. It's a, it's an under thing. That's it, a, it's an under thing, and that's, well, these are, these are all uh, under things. What is under thing? Uh, well, an under thing is, uh, you, well, you, 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 you wear it under your dress. Don't look to be too sturdy, little Joe. Don't you reckon they'll wear out awful quick? Uh, Trudy. Um, why don't you... 
take, take these upstairs and try them on there, and I'm sure your instincts will tell you what goes with what. You can still paint pictures. How? And today you described a scene to me. You remember? You described it as you remembered seeing it. But what you were talking about was so much more beautiful than what I was looking at. Don't you understand? You can still paint pictures. Not with a brush. With a pen. You didn't try to tell me that. I almost forgot. He's a thief because he's smaller than you are, if that's possible. Ben, I told you yesterday, he should live with his own kind. If God had meant us all to live together, he would have made us all the same. Well, you may be right. And I may be very wrong. And maybe you know something I don't. You see, I don't know how tall God is. When someone you love dies, afterward, even long afterward, you can still see him, hear his voice, the sound of the laughter. I loved him so much, and I knew I could never have him, but I could have his baby, a part of him that I could love for the rest of my life. Can you understand why I wanted Scott? I'm, uh, I'm not asking you to say that it was right. Because I, I suppose I know that it wasn't. But can you understand why? There was some really um, emotional scenes that that Lauren had in the show. Um, does anybody want to share like their favorite scenes or maybe their favorite episode or even lines? Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Carol. That was um, brings back all kinds of memories. But uh, I, I just have to say that uh, before we get into talking about Ben, who we all know and love, Lauren Green as Ben, um, I have to tell you what my 97-year-old mother, what she knows Lauren Green as. And I, I'll ask her sometimes, say, do you remember? Because her memory's not that good anymore. But I, I'll ask her, do you remember Lauren Green? And she'll say, oh, yes, we, we well, I'm from Canada. And uh, we would listen to Lauren every day on the radio. And he would tell us, about the Canadian troops and where they were and how they were doing. And he'd have to report to us all the Canadian casualties. And she was just, when I say Lauren Green to my 97 year old mother and to her generation, to Canadians, he is the voice of Canada. And he will always, I'm getting emotional because my father was a veteran of World War II. And he, Lauren Green meant so much to Canadians. And he still means a lot to Canadians. 
He was given the Order of Canada, which is the highest honor given to civilians. And he's still displayed in the CBC radio and television building in Toronto. And he means so much to the broadcast community as much as uh, Ben Cartwright means to Americans, Canadians, he, the voice of Canada, and I'll always love him for that. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you, Barb. You've got me emotional as well now. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine anybody else playing that role. I mean, he had so much strength, and then at the same time, along with that commanding presence, he could just portray so much kindness and gentleness at the same time. I think it it's really says a lot about him as a person and as an actor. Does anybody else have anything they would like to share? The epitome of the perfect father. You can understand how kids or anyone would just want him as their dad and how he would be the perfect example of how to rear children now. I think discipline has gone out of a lot of families and he he would just he he, he would be an icon of a father. Thank you. Patina? His acting never seems contrived. And it's like especially in the moments when he's uh disciplining Joe and Haas, like telling the rough house outside. Um chastising them about being drunk in town it always feels like a real father talking to his real sons and a combination of you irritate the heck out of me but I, I still love you and you're such a big disappointment but I still love you um it other shows even of that time period it's like it feels so acted and it never seems acted on Bonanza. I don't know why, but I always love that um the scenes where he's getting mad at one of his boys and you know he's just so mad he just wants to wring their necks. I don't know why those are always my favorite ones. And I and maybe it's because of what you said, you know, you can actually feel like, you know, this is a real father getting aggravated on I love you, but <laughs> you're driving me crazy. Lynn? Ben when I first started watching Bonanza, as I've previously said, I was only six. And this man had a very, very loud voice. And now I was raised with a father who reminded me an awful lot of Ben in the fact that he was very tall. He had the grey hair. He had those deep chocolate brown eyes, just like Ben's. But my dad never raised his voice. He was always very, very quietly spoken. And the most he ever had to say to me if I was misbehaving was just say my name. He'd just look up at me over his newspaper and go, Lynn, and that would be enough. So when I was six, Ben did scare me a little bit, I'll be honest, because he shouted so much. And, of course, he shouted a lot at Joe, who deserved it. But as a six-year-old, I was, you know, oh, I wish he wouldn't shout Joe. But obviously, over the years, as I've grown up and... Now I see him in, in a much, much different light. But I mean, he does he does have a wonderful way with him. He's just you you just think if I could just go home to somebody like that and just go, oh, it's all gone wrong. He'd just give you a hug and it would all just go right again. He, he's just got something. And and I mean, he gets quite emotional at times as well, which I also love because, you know, all this Western men are supposed to be tough and all this. He he doesn't mind showing his feelings. I mean, we've seen him tear up in more than one episode and, and particularly with Joe, who obviously Mike was absolutely first class at doing that, wasn't he? Um, but it's just lovely to see. And he and as every Everybody else has already said he just was the best dad ever I mean you just you just know that whatever had happened yeah he might yell but he'd help you and he'd sort it out and, and he'd help anybody else as well which was lovely there was no side on him he, he you know anybody I mean like again in those lovely clips that Carol put together you know with the with the man who's small in stature with the with the lady who has the baby out of wedlock he doesn't judge. He just wants to help. And and that's just what's so lovely about him. So, you know, yeah, wonderful to see. Wonderful. Franny, you have something to share? Um, 
Ben was actually my second car right? My first one was Haas, obviously, and uh, but Ben was my second. And I think mainly it's maybe the Canadian connection because um, I grew up watching him on Lawrence Green New World and Lauren Green's New Wilderness. I remember seeing him on Battlestar Galactica, and then when I found him on uh, Bonanza, I was like, this can't be, is this the same guy? Because <laughs> I was like, it no, can't be the same guy. But yeah, he um, he does remind me of my dad, even though, like I said earlier, my dad was a recovering alcoholic. Uh, when uh, I watched The Dying Darkness, I swear I'm watching my father. Because he's got the same beard, the same look. And that was why that was a little bit hard for me to watch. But I always liked how he was there for each of his sons. He didn't treat any of them differently, even though they were, you know, uh, from different mothers or anything. They were all brothers. They weren't half. And he was just, uh, I love how he always, he's always there. But yeah, I think for me personally, part of it was the, um, that I actually adore Lauren as well. He did the National Film Board of Canada here as well. He, uh, he uh, wants to narrate something, so I knew from that. But he, uh, he definitely made us proud, and he'll always make us proud, and he made me proud to be a Canadian. So he's one of the good ones, and yeah, he was always my second car right man. I'll always say he was my second car right. Uh, I just had a general comment. I think one of the best moments between uh, Lauren and Mike in the whole series was in Forever. Uh, that's why I've only seen it a few times, uh, where after the house is burned down and they embrace, it was just so real because those are real tears. Those are real tears. And it's just a very, very emotional, heartfelt scene that really was wonderful. And I'm glad Carol included that one. Yeah, I agree. I can only watch that a few times. Yeah. I mean, I could cry now if I thought about it, because I'm like you. I know that those are real tears and that they're right. really experiencing a, a loss. Carol, with the K? Yes, I would like to say um, Ben was a true and understanding father. You could believe him and trust him. And that is very important, I think for people, for uh, younger people also, because I think when he had uh, young people or younger sons, he would speak a little bit more quiet, I think. Not so loud. <laughs> Carol Trant? Yeah, I just want to um, comment back on what, what Bob just said. The reason I didn't let that scene run too long was I didn't want it to be a total, 14 is a tough year, even though there were some great episodes. The reason I cut it off when he said, same old pa always worrying, and pa said I wasn't worrying, and Joe said, no, no, you were worried, was to go with the scene prior that he says he still thinks of them as his little boys. I, I love the scene when they embrace too, but I just thought it was too dark to, to let it run for this particular event. I just wanted to say that. But I, I love that moment too. But it was, I didn't want to kind of bring up Hoss being gone at a, I don't know, just didn't want to do that. Andy? I wanted to tip my cowboy hat, if I were wearing one, to Carol for doing another fantastic job she just knows the characters, she knows the actors, she knows the scenes better than anyone, truly, truly. And I thought it might be apt now to share some bit of a conversation that I had with Chuck Green. Chuck Green is Lauren Green's son. Uh, Lauren was married to Rita Hands in 1940, and Chuck and his twin sister, Linda, were born in 1944. So they were teenagers when Bonanza began and were very excited and have recollections of watching the premiere uh, in a color set um, with uh, family and friends and, and occasionally visiting the set, um, but not that often because they soon after went away to school. Uh, Chuck went to MIT in Massachusetts and Linda 
believe went to UCLA, so she probably could visit the set more often. But in a in a rather unguarded, candid moment, Chuck said to me, you know, I wish that I had Ben Cartwright for my father. And and he continued, he said, I had Lorne Green, and Lorne Green had plenty of flaws, and he tried. And he talked about how his father uh, wanted very much to be a successful actor, which meant being away from home a lot of the time when Chuck and Linda were growing up. And Linda told me that she was a bit more level-headed, a bit more understanding, maybe because she was female and more forgiving. But she said her brother Chuck had had a rough time of it for a while as as a as an adolescent. He really needed his father more, but his father was busy being the father figure to the world. And I'm glad that when Chuck matured and became an adult, he and his father became closer because Lorne Green and Chuck Green were very closely involved in collaborative activities like Lorne Green's New Wilderness. And I think that was very important for, for Chuck and and his relationship with his father. But I thought that was such a telling comment that he wished he had Ben Cartwright for a father, but he didn't. He had Lorne Green, who arguably was the next best thing. But I guess ultimately there really is no Ben Cartwright in real life. We we can only aspire to be the the perfect father that Ben Cartwright seemed to be, and and Ben Cartwright wasn't perfect, but he always tried. And as I think we know, Lorne Green has said that he patterned his Ben Cartwright character after his own father, Daniel Green, who was an orthopedic bootmaker, uh, uh, an immigrant from Russia, who came to Canada in the early part of the 20th century. And and Lorne Green had a great regret that his father, Daniel, didn't live to see Bonanza. Daniel passed away in 1956, and he felt that his his father would have been very proud of his performance, as indeed we all are and all have been inspired by his performance, which stands the test of time as the, as the ideal father figure. Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Lynn? Uh, just a, a quick aside, which is not, not really bonanza, but several years ago, I went to one of these um, film and comic convention uh, things and uh, Dirk Benedict and Richard Hatch were there who were with Lorne in Battlestar Galactica. And obviously being a Bonanza fan myself, as well as I liked Battlestar Galactica, I got talking to them and I I was trying to sort of get some more information about what Lorne was really like. And Richard said, um, he said, well, he said he was just everybody's dad. He said he was he said what you saw is him as Ben Cartwright. He was just the same as Adama. He said we all went to him if if we had a problem or we had something, you know, out of out of work or sort of thing. We we talked to him about it because he was always there and he was always happy to talk. But he said he was he just he just liked caring for people. And and that is something I have also noticed throughout the years of being involved with, you know, Bonanza and all that. Nobody has ever had anything bad to say about Lorne Green. He he was a lovely man. And, 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 you know, what we saw on the screen and what, you know, out of, you know, off the screen, he, he always seemed to be such a lovely man. I mean, it is sad about Chuck. I mean, obviously he left Canada and he went away to, to New York, I think first to, to get work when he wanted to become an actor. And, and obviously, you know, he didn't see his children as much as he would like. And and it's nice that they did manage to reconnect when, when you know, Chuck was older. But, um, you know, I mean, that was probably a regret to, to Lorne as well, I'm sure. But, you know, he, he, he certainly, you know, anybody that seems to have had anything to do with him always says what a lovely man he was. And, and that's, that's, that's a must be a wonderful testament, mustn't it? If nothing else, you know, that everybody can say that about him. So that was all I wanted to say. Thank you, Lynn. I can't remember what 
magazine it is, but there is an article where Lauren does comment that he wished he had been able to be with his um, older children more than what he was and that he, um, you know, was trying to start his career and, and earn income for his for his family. But I, I know he did regret that. You're right. Melissa? After I logged off last night, I was very much in the mood to watch some Bonanza episodes. And <laughs> so I watched the Ponderosa Matador and then I watched the um, the Quality of Mercy since we were all talking about that on the first night. And I was watching the Quality of Mercy with my sister. And I know that we were discussing that scene with Lauren and Mike <laughs> where it does not cut where he comes in. He's talking about like the morality of whether mercy killing like in a situation is like moral or not. And I'm sitting there and I'm I'm just like, it just suddenly crossed my mind, like two schools of thought here. The first being, you don't see scenes that long nowadays between two characters where they're both able to carry a conversation, but you're so engaged with like how they're performing it and what the script is talking about without zoning out, um, which I thought was really interesting. But I also thought like, my gosh, how many like... TV dads, could you name today that have the character writing of Ben being this very involved parent? Um, he's not just, because I've noticed today that there's a trend in media where it's like, oh, the parent doesn't know anything, but the kid knows everything or the kid can um, solve the problems. I think like when I was a child, I never enjoyed like The Little Mermaid, for example, because I thought I'm like, why is Ariel acting like this? Her father knows what's best. <laughs> Um, and so I just think from like a, a character writing standpoint, I think that to really like include Ben in the boys' lives and still have him be that source of like wisdom and still be that source of like, um, here's the morally good and here's the morally wrong was just really nice and not to see him run off as, oh, he's just the dad. Um, so I think like moments like that, specifically like in the quality of mercy where he's like really engaged, um, they're just nice to see. Yeah, I agree. Um, I didn't notice it so much when I was, you know, a child, but I remember my dad commenting that he didn't like a lot of sick calls because they, you know, targeted the dad and he was like, I'm, I'm a good dad. You know, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm intelligent. I care what my kids see and do. Um, so yeah, I think he, he liked Bonanza too, because, uh, the father was represented as a strong, caring person and not, an, you know, moron. Uh, Kevin? Yeah, I had a question going back to this scene in Forever. I've read somewhere where that was, uh, I guess, a public memorial, so to speak, uh, between Lauren and Michael, you know, to Dan. I know in the, the scene, you know, following it, it uh, when Joe is, you know, packing up to leave and, and Lauren comes in the room there, uh, it pans uh, to a, a photo of Dan and Michael there on the desk, you know, right after, you know, right before it, it goes off there. So I didn't know if anybody could answer that. Is that, was that, I mean, David, yeah, I know the tears were real. I was just wondering if that was their tears for Dan. Thank you, Kevin, for, for bringing that point up and um, very astute and you're very observant and you have zeroed in on an extremely important part, not only of that scene, but arguably the, the history of the entire series. And Mitch Vogel, who was there, everybody knows he played Jamie, um, Kent McRae, production manager, who was there, uh, both told me the same story independently when um, Michael and Lauren were doing the scene in the aftermath of the horrific fire, and they had to be extremely emotional. Um, Mitch, who, who wasn't even supposed to be on the set that day, but was on the set and wanted to watch, observed uh, Michael especially, and Lauren too, uh, going off to the side to do something and spending a, a few moments off to the side, off stage, and then coming back and uh, the camera was turned on and they shot the scene. And when it was all over, Mitch went over to see what what they were looking at. And it was, in fact, a photograph of Dan Blocker. Uh, I'm sure the photograph that was put in the scene of Joe's bedroom. So, yeah, yeah, there was a tremendous, tremendous emotional connection that 
they had with each other. And, and that includes Purnell Roberts, incidentally. Purnell and Dan were very good friends. And after Purnell left the show, and he had a tendency to uh, wander a bit um, to make up for lost time, perhaps. He did a lot of traveling, often, or at least on some occasions. He'd come back to Los Angeles, and he'd stay in Dan Blocker's home. Um, but there was such a close connection between those guys, and, and Lorne Green has been quoted as saying it was like... Uh, father, son, truly. I think first he said brother, brother, but then he changed it to father, son. And certainly with Michael, it was losing a brother that he never had. So Michael in subsequent uh, years has admitted that whenever he needed to cry, he would pull a hair from his nostril. And, and then he added in a more serious note that he would just think about Dan and that would make him cry. Thank you, Kevin. Good, good question. Thank you, Andy. And I think I read somewhere else. Did Purnell actually pay for Dan's funeral? I thought. Maybe no, no, no. Some of the expenses there, or something no, along I, I think, lines. Okay. I think uh, what has been misrepresented is Purnell paid for Victor Sen Young's funeral. Purnell oh, okay. attended. Purnell attended Victor Sen Young's funeral, but the implication that that Vic was destitute and his family could not pay for the funeral is is just absolutely wrong. But Purnell did attend. Um, Purnell was at Lauren Green's funeral, and um, I heard from at least one person that Purnell was also at Michael Landon's funeral. So uh, I have no reason to believe that those uh, accounts were false. Um, again, they were they were all very very close, much closer than than press and publicity would would have you think. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. All right, Barbara Ann. Hi, I uh, don't want to take the discussion off on a different path and get in the weeds, but I was wondering which wife of Ben's is your favorite. That's a great question. Um. I would probably say Inger um, because, you know, Ben was struggling with his first wife's death and, um, you know, he was a little bit bitter. And I liked her because, you know, it's kind of easy to fall in love with someone, in my opinion, that's sweet and charming and, you know, in a good place in their life. But, you know, she kept after him and, you know, changed his heart. And uh, so that's why she's my favorite. Oh, she's mine, too. Thanks. I was about to ask you who yours was. D. Hi, I just wanted to um, tell Kevin also that um, I don't know if he was aware, but uh, Lauren and um, Michael purchased property, uh, beach property in uh, Malibu, just north of Malibu, uh, and had and turned it over to the state, and it's the Dan Blocker Beach. It, it was actually property that Lauren, Michael, and Dan purchased together. They they shared the same business manager. And yes, you're absolutely right, Dee, after Dan Blocker passed away, so so suddenly and unexpectedly, um, Lauren and Michael decided to donate that land to um, to the city of Los Angeles. It took a while for them to develop it, but it was dedicated as the Dan Blocker Beach Gosh, a long time ago now. I, yeah, it took like 10 years to get through all the red tape of, yeah, yeah. you know, all that stuff I read. Mm -hmm. if, if, yeah. if I could um, just add a postscript quickly to the uh, to the wives topic, I'll say that um, Geraldine Brooks, who played uh, Elizabeth, was married to Bud Schulberg, um, who was the son of B.P. Schulberg, who was a big mover and shaker in the Hollywood industry in the silent film days. And Bud Schulberg uh, was quite a, an accomplished writer. Uh, he wrote The Day of the Locusts, which was um, made into a, a sort of a tell-all film about the dark, seedy side of Hollywood. And so David Dortort was at one of these Hollywood parties and was talking to Bud Schulberg and his wife, Geraldine, and uh, was looking at Geraldine and, and thought she would be perfect to play Adam Cartwright's mother. And he asked her at the party, and she said, Sure, I would love to, and they worked it out. And Inga Swenson was at the top of her game. She was starring in a Broadway smash hit called Once Upon a Mattress. No, no, I'm sorry, that was Carol Burnett. 
Um, Angus Swenson was starring in, uh, was it Evening Shade? It was Evening Shade. Anyway, it was a big hit on Broadway in the early 1960s. And um, David Dortort and Bill Mayberry, his casting director, very much wanted Inga Swenson to play the part, but she was engaged on Broadway, but managed to get time off. And she wasn't a supporting character. She was the lead in the show. So that gives you also an example of the influence and impact and importance of Bonanza at that time. So uh, Inga Swenson was given two weeks off uh, uh, to go to Los Angeles and rehearse and prepare and, and play uh, Inga in Inger, my love. And and as I think many of us will agree, she probably was the, the, the most popular of the mothers, so much so that she's the only one that's the focus of two shows. And so she was invited back to do a sequel, Journey Remembered. Uh, Felicia Farr at the time was the wife of Jack Lemmon, and she was enthusiastic about doing the part until during filming of the um, dueling sequence in New Orleans and the uh, prop assistant was given the assignment of, of filling the soundstage with fog and the director kept insisting more fog, more fog, more fog and this poor old technical special effects guy was going back and forth, back and forth and collapsed, had a heart attack and died right there on the set in front of Felicia Fogg which I'm sure we would all agree, was pretty traumatic. And apparently it just soured her on any possibility at all of coming back to the Bonanza Company. So although there certainly was um, discussion and hope that there would be a second episode that told the story of Marie at the Ponderosa in the very early days and, and raising her petit Joseph and falling off the horse that led to her un in untimely demise. There was no way that Felicia Farr would do that part. So that's why they didn't, they didn't have to follow up. It's very good, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> I tried. I have trivia for you, which you probably really? already know. Yeah. The, I think Lauren really liked um, Inga and he, she was supposed to play his love interest in his show Griff. Oh, you're but, absolutely right. Absolutely right. It got canceled before that could take place. Yes, yes, absolutely right. And um, I'll add that Lewis Allen, who directed all of the flashback episodes, which incidentally were all written or co-written by Anthony Lawrence, uh, Lewis told me that Lauren told him that his favorite, bon favorite Bonanza episodes were the flashback ones, and Lou added because he looked so young and handsome. I agree. <laughs> Lynn? Just on the subject of of which was our which of the wives was our favorite. I mean, although um, you know Joe is my favorite, it wasn't his mother that was my favorite. It was Inga, definitely. Mm -hmm. I just saw her on the Ponderosa. I just saw her as a good soulmate for for Ben, somebody who he could you know rely on. She seemed quite a strong, determined person. She she had a background of you know, before she come to, to America of, of um, living on a farm, she had, she just seemed the, the right sort of person. And of course she, she adored Adam right from the start, which is, which is lovely because, you know, taking on somebody else's child is not something that all women want to do, but she, she just seems such a lovely person. And, you know, I think it's such a shame that even though I know we got Joe because of Marie, um, that, that she didn't survive because I, I really did like Inga. I thought she was definitely the best choice. So that's all I wanted to say. I agree. Um, is it Hardy? Howdy. Howdy, Hardy. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say, Rachel, I love your Instagram and your trivia you post. That's some good stuff there. Uh, you know, growing up as a child of the 60s to a single mother and uh, in a lot of poverty, you know, a lot of TV was my escape at that point, And Bonanza was my ultimate escape because it had everything that I was missing, uh, you know, from my life. A, a father figure, siblings. I was an only child. So, you know, I, I it just had a huge impact on my life. And, and, and the character of, of Ben has continued uh, to this day to, to influence how I am as a parent, how I treat my children, all that stuff. So I just want to say that that's how that's how it impacted me in my life. 
Uh, also, Rachel, I want to ask you, is that a uh, picture of Lauren behind you? Um, I love your comments. Um, that's very moving. Thank you for sharing. Um, yes, that's actually, you're talking about the picture that's hanging on the, the wall behind me, which I can't yes. see in there. Yet. Yep. Yeah, that good eye, that is Lauren. That is from his um, TV series, Sailor of Fortune from 1955. And it's probably one of my favorite pictures of him that I have. Andy, can you do me a favor? Sure. I can't get the chat on my Zoom working. Can you see if there's sure. any questions or comments? Few. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, um, loved all the show. Loved that show. Wish it was available on DVD. I don't know what Janet the Wicked is saying about that. Maybe it's a different show than Bonanza, but uh, love... Uh, loved all three. Ben's story was Elizabeth, most realistic. Uh, oh, Janet is saying she wishes Sailor of Fortune was available on DVD, and I agree with that. Um, Marie says Lorne lost his hair in the water. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a funny story during filming of San Francisco. Do I have time, Rachel, to tell that story real quick? Do you think people will appreciate that? Yeah, I think so. Um, during the filming of San Francisco Holiday, first season, there was a scene where uh, Ben was shanghaied and, and Hoss and Little Joe were rescuing him. And uh, the action takes place on a soundstage at the renowned Paramount B water tank. So Lauren's in the water and apparently his hairpiece, and I hope this is not too shocking to any of you, Lauren actually had a little bit of supplemental hair and it apparently rose to the top. So the assistant director gave the order, clear the set, clear the set. And uh, Lauren wore a hairpiece. Everybody knew he wore a hairpiece, but Lauren didn't know that everyone knew he wore a hairpiece. So the assistant director knew that Lauren was sensitive about it, so we cleared the set. And of course, Michael Landon and Dan Blocker were not going to leave the set because they'd never seen Paul without his hair. So darned if they were gonna miss this once in a lifetime opportunity. But um, Michael Landon wrote uh, very effectively and perhaps a um, bit elaboratingly that uh, Lorne was underwater for a good amount of time and suddenly was aware of a hand that reached up to the surface and started moving around like this, found what they called the gray rug, pulled it down under the water, and then Lorne emerged seconds later triumphantly with his hand on top of his hair uh, intact. So uh, yeah, that was how Lauren lost his hair. But interestingly, I was told that his attitude changed significantly after 1968, after his uh, daughter Gillian was born. He, he didn't care then, after that, who saw him with or without his hair. So that was interesting. Um, I did not know about Felicia Farr. Uh, Lauren was very careful about the way he looked. You know, that's an understatement. Um, uh, Michael was the most caring about the way he looked. In fact, Tim Matheson told us yesterday that Mike even did his own makeup. He wouldn't trust anyone else to do his makeup at that late date. And Mitch Vogel said he wore black gloves just to be cool. And he had his green jacket collar reinforced to make him look more cool. Um... Uh, Nassim writes, it amazes me how they could find great actresses who looked so much like their sons in the show. How oh, these all gather in each of them. Wish we could have seen Joe's birth. Okay. Uh, Inger had two episodes. Inger took to little Adam like her own. Takes a big person to do that. My favorite was Marie, Joe's mother. I liked all the wives. My favorite is Inger. Ben's wife seemed to get younger as he got older. Interesting. I think Inger's charming accent added points for her, too. She was hard not to like. Uh, who was the wife from New Orleans? So there's a question, Rachel. <laughs> I think we know that. That that, that was Ron's favorite, uh, Marie, the third wife. Inger was a sweetheart. Um, Inger was darling. Uh, my favorite, too. My favorite, too. Definitely Inger. Inger is my favorite. Uh, The story that Andy told about the scene in Forever with Ben and Joe was told to me by both Kent and Mitch at a convention. That's from Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, the quality of mercy, one of the most powerful scenes between Ben and Joe encapsulates so many layers of intensity, the guilt, the life, death philosophy, the father and son, intense mutual devotion and trust, and their need to support 
even though in doubt in their agreement on personal beliefs. Thank you, Nessim, very, very, um, very insightful. So, so Rachel, no, no real questions, mostly just, just comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment. I remember uh, Mike being on the Tonight Show and telling the story about uh, Ben in the tank, but he, he referred as the gray rat. <laughs> That's fun. And the audience roared. <laughs> And and um, I'm also thinking of another memory. When they first started filming, they were up at Lake Tahoe. And Michael, of course, tells the famous story of how they couldn't sit down for a week. The four guys were standing up and having dinner by the bar. But Mike and Dan shared a room at the hotel at Tahoe. And Lauren and Purnell shared a room. So Mike and Dan said to Purnell, so, so what, what does Pa look like without his hair? And so Purnell said, I don't know. He never takes it off. I think maybe he, he wears it in bed. <laughs> hey, um, Andy, there's, yes. a question, there's a question now in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, does anyone know what happened to the young actor, Johnny Stevens, who played Little Adam in the flashback episodes? Uh, I, I'd like to think that somebody knows, but unfortunately, none of us here. I, I did try to track him down, thinking he would be a wonderful person to do an audio commentary, but... I had no success whatsoever. Um, neither he nor Donald Lowsby, who was the young boy in the Jackknife episode from the third year, they seem to have vanished from the showbiz uh, milieu without a trace, which is unfortunate. You know, sometimes you can track down people because of residuals they get through the Screen Actors Guild, but sometimes the Screen Actors Guild doesn't have contact information for people. And so the money doesn't go to them. And so you can't find them. Or at least I cannot find them. Maybe someone with better research skills. Well, maybe somebody will will track them down. Thanks, Hopefully. Andy. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, one more last comment that Nassim had apparently written earlier was, sorry, I can't unmute where I am, but I'd like to mention this. If you can read it aloud, please. What I'd like to highlight is that Ben is this warm, generous, and huge father figure of his sons. But at the same time, I think all the ladies, girls, and daughters in the world can connect to his limitless fatherhood. He is a father to all because he portrays the depth of the character, the moral frame of wisdom and emotions of it. And that is so inclusive to all genders and ages. Excellent, Nassim. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Ginger, for bringing that up. 